All right, I'm going to get us started. If everyone wants to sit down, I want to welcome you to our second Metro Talks. And um, this is something that the Bay Area Regional Collaborative uh, helped kick off. I'm executive director of BARC. And if you're not familiar, uh, I help coordinate the four agencies. There's three of them in here now. But the fourth one hopefully is on the way that are in this building. And this is such a beautiful building. In fact, we're going to hear tonight from the architect of this building um, that I think it's re we just thought it really important is a create a space where a community can come together and talk about issues that the regional agencies are focused on and that we all care about. Really, what a better time to talk about uh, to talk about resiliency actually in the topic that we have tonight. Um, so I, we've all experienced such a incredible summer of one uh, catastrophe after another ex that many parts of our country and the world are experiencing. So um, let's talk about resiliency. I'm Al I, I don't think I introduced myself. I'm Allison Brooks. I'm, um, as I said, Executive Director of BARC. And um, I want to thank VJ Kaysabin, who's the Program Coordinator for BARC. She put on the whole Oktoberfest theme for tonight. So I, I think that's pretty awesome. <laughs> Um, so tonight we have three really uh, wonderful speakers that are part of the Resilient by Design Bay Area Challenge. I also am uh, chairing the executive committee or the, the board of the Resilient by Design Bay Area Challenge. Rupal Songvi is going to be our first speaker and Rupal's actually on the research advisory committee for Resilient by Design. And if you go to resilientbayarea.org, if you haven't already, you can get a lot more details about the Resilient by Design challenge and um, hear more, see who else is on the research advisory committee. Uh, Rupal uh, in 2009 founded HealthX Design, identifying untapped opportunities that leverage de design decision making about the built environment as a public health intervention, addressing the predictors of health and its determinants. She's a principal investigator at the Public Health Institute, a fellow at the Design Trust for Public Space, and faculty at Parsons New School for Design. Rupal has over 15 years of experience in health promotion and disease prevention. She has partnered with community-based nonprofit organizations and the public sector in infectious disease prevention, violence prevention, adolescent health promotion, and access to care for marginalized and geographically isolated groups. Rupal has been a consistent uh, reviewer for the American Public Health Conference and has worked with the World Health Organization, International Planned Parenthood, and the International Rescue Committee. She received the United States Secretary of Health Award for Innovations in Health Promotion and Disease Prevention after earning her Master of Public Health at the University of Michigan. She's going to be our first speaker. The next one will be Hank Ovink, and I've had the honor of introducing Hank two days in a row. He's been on quite the speaker circuit in the Bay Area. He's visiting us from the, the Netherlands where he serves as special envoy for international water affairs for the Kingdom of the Netherlands. He was appointed in 2015 in this role um, and is the ambassador for water. Um, he's also the Sherpa. I love how you're called the Sherpa for the, um, to the high-level panel on water installed by UN Secretary Ban Ki-moon and President of the World Bank, World Bank Jim Kim with 10 heads of state, including Prime Minister Ruti from the Netherlands to catalyze change in water awareness and implementation. And Hank is also on the jury of Resilient by Design, which has uh, the jury, if you, you're not aware, selects has selected the 10 design teams that are participating in the effort. Um, and he comes to us because Hank was uh, pinpointed by President Obama and HUD Secretary um, Sean Donovan after Hurricane Sandy to lead up the rebuild by design effort uh, after um, and, and really started that, which is what the Resilient by Design uh, project is modeled after. And last but not, and he's also a teacher at the London School for Economics and Harvard and I, can I stop now, Hank? Because you're a very important man. <laughs> is that okay? Um, and Kathy Simon, last but not least, who is, I mean, we're sitting in a building that Kathy was instrumental in designing. So um, thank you, Kathy, because we're all enjoy the people that work in this building really enjoy it every day. She uh, has a focus on transformative design and it, it, that is evident at all scales. Um, she's received all kinds of awards for her architectural 
work over the years, including the San Francisco Ferry Building and Pier 1, um, Genentech B35, uh, and a new 250,000 square foot headquarters of Genentech's South San Francisco campus, the Lathrop Library at Stanford, uh, Connie and Kevin Chow Hall at the Haas School of Business at UC Berkeley, and of course this building. In 2015, she was the William A. Bernardi Architect in Residence at the American Academy of Rome, and has taught architecture at both UC Berkeley and Stanford University. She is a member of the Harvard Graduate School of Design, uh, and the University of Washington Architectural Commission, and the University of California Berkeley Design Review Committee. And she's also on the Research Ad Advisor Committee for Resilient by Design, the Bay Area Challenge. So we are, we are so lucky to have this expertise, participate in this effort we have going on here in the Bay Area to come up with in innovative design solutions for some of our biggest challenges including wildfires. So um, I will stop there and I'm gonna invite Rupal up to provide her presentation. So thank you so much, Allison, for that very kind introduction. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be here today um, to have this important and timely conversation with you all about resilience. Um, and I'm specifically gonna be talking about integrating a population-based approach um, and what that even means um, with design to advance uh, social resilience in particular. Um, and before I start, I wanna do two things. One is to say how honored and humbled I am to be on a panel with Hank and Kathy. So thank you so much for inviting me to do that. Um, and the second is to see, kind of get a sense of who's in the room. So how many of you are engineers? Okay, a lot of you. What about architects, urban designers, planners? Um, any health sector folks? Good, okay. So I come to you um, as a public health practitioner who has designed and evaluated public health interventions around the world over now the last 20 years. Um, and I started Health by Design uh, around eight years ago because what we know is that 80% of the disease burden in the United States and really globally, um, has to do with environmental determinants um, that we can actually influence, meaning we could actually prevent 80% of the disease burden if we could um, shape those determinants that shape our experience of the environment. So what do I mean by population-based approach? In public health, we um, define our success by how well people are doing. So what are trends at a population level? Uh, we distinguish between health-friendly or health-positive approaches and a public health approach or population-based approach, which means moving the needle at a certain scale. It could be a scale of a neighborhood, a city, um, a country, a region, um, or it could specify populations cultural groups, um, age groups. But a long time ago, over 50 years ago, the World Organization, Health Organization actually defined health, so we're talking about population-based health, that has to move the needle at a certain scale, with health being very broad. So um, the World Health Organization defined itself separate from what we call the biomedical model. Um, so what we said was, in public health, we mean health means human flourishing, that it is not just the absence of illness, and we acknowledge how connected and interrelated health is to uh, environmental, ecological, social, and economic uh, determinants. So for us, resilience is really sort of central to what we do, um, and we think about all different kinds of chronic stressors or shocks to social systems that that in turn uh, influence health um, at a population level. So we think about um, economic stressors. We think about um, armed conflict and war and um, how that influences health outcomes. And of course, we're here today to talk about um, the stress and potential shock related to climate um, change. So social vulnerability that predicts for health risk is also 
really the same um, predictors as as we're talking about with climate change, um, population-related climate change risk. And I'm sorry for all this technical language. I know you've all had like two glasses of wine and it's the evening. Um, I'm gonna, you know, um, but I think this is really important to say that essentially things that make um, us healthy and promote human flourishing are the very um, factors and predictors um, that we know will promote resilience in the context of climate change. So I think that's really important, and um, it's important for us to sort of talk about what we know in terms of challenges, and then I'm also going to be talking about opportunities. So what are the population-based challenges as we talk about them in public health um, that we need to consider um, in the context of resilience? We know that income inequality is on the rise, and we know about something called the American health disadvantage. So in 2014, the Institute of Medicine published a study, a report uh, that talked about American, the US health outcomes compared to other developing, 16 other developing country, developed countries. And we were dead last across most indicators. And of course, um, the study and the institute asked, um, why, why was this? Uh, what's going on? So they pointed to, um, reasons related to how we live, play, and work, and the role of the built environment. Um, and since then, we have had the American Institute of Architects, the American Public Health Association, American Planning Associ Association come together to um, create something called Design for Health. And um, so that's sort of a joint initiative across professional organizations to start thinking about how to work together. You all well know um, all of our challenges related to transportation and food security is still an issue in many parts of this country. And of course we know a lot of people are living in low-lying areas amidst sea level rise, but then we know that there's other um, sort of hazards, including fires, of course. And um, so there will be a growing need to translate what we know in public health to advance um, adaptive capacity. Um, so we know some stuff in public health, um, in social science, and I say that um, to subtly or not so subtly, um, to sort of talk about how maybe that's not fully being translated or leveraged and um, how I hope we can talk about that uh, later today. Um, so we know some stuff. I'm sorry that I'm presenting such a detailed framework. So. Don't worry about it, I'm gonna tell you about the two things you should take away from it. I know Hank is gonna present some framework, so I felt like I should include some too. Um, but the main two takeaways are that um, social vulnerability is com concentrated and compounded in the context of climate change and storm events, et cetera. But what I really wanna focus on, because I could also uh, talk a lot about health risks related to climate change, we could talk about air quality and asthma and mosquitoes, but what I really wanna focus on is our um, opportunities to promote health, um, human flourishing and resilience, which I'm essentially saying those are, have really common predictors and factors. So what are those? So one, one aspect of that is promoting social capital. So when people feel connected to each other, they have social networks, they're more likely um, not only to just have a generally great time in life, <laughs> they also are gonna be able to cooperate when there is a, a disaster, an event, um, and stewardship. So people feeling connected to their environment, their natural environment, in everyday life, that's gonna be really important to continue to um, support um, the, the marshes and all of the ecology that's really important uh, in landscape resilience, but also um, stewardship in, in terms of after a, a disaster. Safety, something that a lot of people tell me they don't know um, in this world of resilience is that um, violence against women and girls spikes during a disaster event. Uh, a lot of that data comes out of Katrina, so from our own country. Um, and so there are things we should be mindful of as we make disaster plans, but also as we design our environments and neighborhoods um, to promote safety and perceptions of safety. Um, and then of course, health status and um, just generally, uh, generally healthy environments to say that we can think about and we know what the predictors are about, um, related to that so that we can also, um, you know, again, promote 
generally good health, thriving, human flourishing, but also this ability to sort of bounce back um, from a disaster. So what are ways to integrate um, what we know in social science, population health, with uh, design and development decision making. I'm gonna go really fast um, because I think it's easier to show than tell and I don't have a lot of time here. Um, but I really wanted to sort of talk about how to operationalize this. So we're not just talking about um, ideas. We're saying this requires cross-sector cross collaboration. We work with architects, designers, planners, engineers, um, health systems. And we, um, you know, the sum is greater than its parts. So we really are going to need to leverage all of the knowledge on all of our sides if we are going to be able to work together on these complex challenges. Um, and so that's what I'm lucky enough to get to do uh, with Health by Design. And this is just a quick project that we worked on um, with Hester Street Collaborative and Interface Studio Design in the Far Rockaways after Sandy. Um, so this was a pretty challenging condition. Um, Lots of uh, public housing, lots of vacant lots, both before and after um, Superstorm Sandy, and little to no access to the waterfront, no public access to the waterfront. Um, and what we knew was that social vulnerability was sort of uneven, unevenly distributed across the geography of the Rockaways. So we made a bunch of maps, and our maps are not as pretty as Exploratoriums, and so we're very lucky that <laughs> Resilience by Design is working with all these great partners. But we did uh, what we could with the data we had, and so we also we looked at low-lying areas, we looked at landscape vulnerability, um, at critical physical assets, but then we also looked at some of these predictors of social vulnerability to understand where they were concentrated so that we could deploy sort of a tactical solution um, considering both landscape vulnerability as well as social vulnerability that allowed us to prioritize the sites. Then we said, all right, so now we have some sites. What are the things that we need to credibly do? What do we need to be able to address in terms of predictors that we actually believe the design can do. Um, and so what are opportunities? In this case, we were able to um, sort of consider promoting social interaction and social connection, local economic development, air quality, um, safety, among other things, and access to healthcare uh, through co-locating providers. But this helped us sort of make, again, a population-based case. So if you're addressing the evidence-based predictors of certain kinds of outcomes that we all agree um, is connected to resilience, then, then we can um, talk about population level impact. Um, and so this was sort of very iterative, um, and it's important, I think, from the public health side to see that this is not conceptual. There are th some things that designers and developers and engineers, um, things that only they can tell us in terms of the opportunity of the site. And there's a finite set of things you can do on a physical site. So we would work with them to understand uh, the trade-offs between what things we can do and different design directions, the kinds of outcomes we could expect ultimately land on a few different designs um, based on the different opportunities where we could make a case that they did, in fact, address uh, the predictors of change. Um, and so I have a lot to, I have a lot more to say, um, but, <laughs> but I'm going to stop there to say that, um, you know, we, we all know that we have some big uh, challenges ahead, um, but I really want to, and I really feel um, strongly that we have a lot of knowledge. Um, we have a lot of shared, we have a lot of human knowledge. I don't know how shared it is. I think through the resilience by design process and getting to work with other experts, not just in my design practice, but really in the Bay Area with water engineers and um, designers and um, uh, government experts, um, it's been really inspiring to see what the opportunities are. And so I want to really talk about how we will take effective action together um, in the service of people. Does anyone have any just really, do you, like you have a question that can't wait right now? Because we're going to have a lot of opportunity for a, a question. OK, good. Nobody? Great. Um, before I forget, I do want to thank Dave Vaughton from the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. Thank you, Dave. He's been instrumental in putting on these Metro Talks, too. So thank you, Dave. <laughs> I forgot that at the beginning. So
So, Hank, you want to come on up? Okay, I have to move fast. Uh, ten minutes is not a lot if you want to talk, t t talk about everything. And um, um, I've I've been presenting in the Bay Area this uh, these days, and uh, uh, we were joking. Uh, what are you going to talk about now? Uh, deny climate change all of a sudden to surprise you all. Um, uh, but I um, actually I won't. Um, Okay, <clears throat> it's important. Uh, WMO, World Meteorological Organization, um, uh, considered around the world as the most fact-based organization. And I've, I've, I, I said this before, it's like, but for me the image is real and some of you haven't heard me say this. For me it's an organization with m men and women in white coats sitting behind computers doing data stuff. Um, you can trust them, that's the, also the feel. You really think that what they do is real fact-based, um, and we're in California, so I can say it's like the anti-Trump, it's like, you know, the next. Yeah? This is all about facts. Uh, they write very, you know, big reports. Uh, but they came up with a yearly report, uh, which they do every year, and then I, uh, this was March, and now I got really scared, because the, the David, David Carlson said, we don't know. So this fact-based, trustworthy, fantastic organization, men and women go by data, say, we are in truly uncharted territory. So they don't know, then what? When they don't know, then what? And it was the same week when the G20 finance ministers got together in Germany and said, oh, we know, Fi climate change is not on, you know, it's not on us. So in the same week where uncharted territory on climate change is real, finance minister said, well, forget it. Uh, we're not care. We don't uh, invest to mitigate. I'm a water guy, so I have to talk about water. Uh, you know everything about water. You have fires now. You had long periods of drought. Yeah? Long, long, long periods of drought. But 2014 was a weird year. This was 2014. This was 2014. The extremes are getting more extremes overall. More extreme rain events going together with longer periods of drought. And our systems are not ready for that. So this is 12 feet sea level rise, not impossible, uh, not the most extreme. Uh, I just passed there with a boat uh, of San Francisco Police Department and I showed them this image. And they got a little scared, so that was good. Water. I'm a water guy, I have to talk about water. Why? Because we don't talk about water. There's no water awareness around the world. We only talk about water when things go wrong, right? When there's a drought, when there's a flood, when there's migration, when there's war, when there's no energy, no food, when there's abuse, inequality, and so forth. Water is at the core and heart of a lot of those challenges. 90% of all natural disasters are water related impacting 40% of our world's population because of too much and too little water, impacting 15% of our GDP, that's real money, real billions of dollars. And we, you know, uh, our aquifers are past that tipping point. You see this man? This is your colleague town, this is Miami. Uh, this is, uh, man was tasked to find the leak in the sewage system. If he would have opened his mouth, he would have tasted the salt of the ocean, because this is not sewage, this is the ocean, thanks to the tide coming up almost every day. We have no clue. People will feel the impact of climate change most profoundly through water. And that's why the G7 said, climate change is a matter of natural security, and water is at its core. But then we live in cities, and those cities are at risk, eh? in rivers, on coasts, and that is assets. This is research done by Professor Hallegatte, and it tells you all, the bigger the circle, the more dollars at risk. So it really tells you uh, the billions and trillions of dollars at risk. Miami leads the list, $278 billion. Then Gangzhou, which is in China, New York, New Orleans. So you see on this map, a lot of US, yeah, you're on it too, uh, a lot of Asia and the Netherlands. So this actually, you know, connects us, you could say. Huh? Assets at risk, but we have a plan. Assets at risk. The next thing that you see on this image is Africa. This is 2050. Africa will have doubled, almost doubled in size. 
No red circles. Why? Because these are dollars at risk, not people. And this is because the poor of the world are worth nothing on a financial level. So if finance is our only driver for change, and finance is often our only driver for change, the poor of the world will lose out. Poor people live in poor places all over the world. In the Netherlands, in Africa, definitely also in the US. Uh, world Economic Forum put water as a number one crisis and also says that if you bring your kid or grandchildren to bed, you know, there's this bedtime story you don't want to tell and it says tomorrow is worse. So you have a good day? Yeah, well, better, because tomorrow is worse. More impact, more likelihood when it comes to these extremes. So this is nightmare, but World Economic Forum understands also the complexity. It says all these challenges are interrelated, social, environmental, cultural, economic. That relationship actually makes it possible to have a pathway forward. If we integrate, if we collaborate, if we come up with a comprehensive approach, from origin, mitigation, and impact, adaptation. But we need to think about an approach that's systemic. Now, yeah, move fast. Uh, SCAPE team developed when we worked on Rebuild by Design in New York, this crazy image saying if we add everything up, the future is tough. You could also say with students and your kids, the past is boring. Uh, uh, this is also why Populism is in the rise because in the 50s we could understand everything, now not. But the good thing is, this is really exciting. This is where we connect the dots. If only we can, then we can come up with sustain sustainable solutions. But we can't because we don't know how to do it. Now, you know this game? Yeah? You know what it is? It's an assessment tool for engineers. We use it in our schools. If you solve it in a minute, you're admitted. If you play with it for the rest of the day, you have to study sociology. <laughs> I use it as a metaphor, as a metaphor for the system. This is what we created. And what we create actually ensures that what we see as a solution. So you only get what you create. So the policies we developed are based on the past. The rules and regulations and governance and the way to collaborate is based on the past. So that's the cube. So you get solutions for the past. And solutions for the past are not solutions for the future. Worse, they are actually the problems for tomorrow. So we have to find a way to bridge the gap. Otherwise, we will never solve the SDGs, never get to implement the Paris Agreement. But we have no clue, we have no business case, we have no time to waste. We don't know what to do when there's a disaster. We're broke. When it comes to adaptation, it's only 4% of the needed capital. There's no business case for the poor. Oh, no, oh. no time to waste, the locking, oh, do it again. Eh? Reiterate yeah, to make it important. So it's big, this disconnect, but we can. We need to find the missing link. Now, how do you find the missing link? By speeding up. This is 100 years. Ever seen a business plan for 100 years? Ever, ever read a policy plan for 100 years or a political manifest for 100? No. Speeding up makes it possible to solve it. Speeding up also is from an economic point of view. You maximize opportunities in the beginning by investing. Uh, you get a higher performance in the end. So it's possible to bridge this gap. But we have to change our approach. I'll skip this. Um, we need a long-term comprehensive approach connected to short-term projects. Why? Only plans are books on a shelf. Only projects are incidents that may have a failing future. The comprehensive plan and the projects have to be connected every day. We have to do it inclusive, including everyone. And you all know that it is very hard to include everyone because we don't know how to do it. Saying the door is always open, practice. Practice what we preach. No, forget it, it's tough. And we have to be transparent, not only for our constituency and our stake and stockholders, but to learn, because we will make a lot of mistakes, especially when we take this serious. If you do this, you build up capacity among governments, institutes, NGOs, and so forth. And we use design. A design is a connector. Now why? 
Design can solve things and produce. Design is opportunistic because it connects across scales, very small, to the very big house, street, community, region, country, across sectors and interest, environmental, social, cultural, and economic, and across time, connecting yesterday with tomorrow. But next to that, design is inspirational and aspirational. And that makes design political, and therefore you can change. But there are conditions. You need a place that is safe enough that you can build trust. Because otherwise it's a negotiation, and with a neg negotiation, everybody loses. You enter the room, you get 80%, so you lost 20. You're a bad negotiator, you get 40%, so you lost more. But when you start to collaborate, you don't know what you want out of it, you only want to know what you're going to put in. And then you're surprised. A collaboration gives you added value. It gives you something in, to, in return. But you need a safe place. You also need to bypass that cube, bypass that system. And not alone, but with all. With Rebuild by Design, we created this bypass where federal government, state and local officials, joint communities, joint NGOs, joint people that lost everything, and we went out in this bypass, this detour, and explored opportunities. And when we found them, we all owned them. Not only the designer, not only the community with its needs, not only the investor, but also the government across all layers. We have to look back and ahead, use design, don't think about heroes, and let talent of those places at risk be connected with the talent of these rooms, of the people that know, eh? the engineers, the designers, the professionals. That means you have to be really inclusive. The door should be always open. My team went crazy. Every time we had to change the process because we invited a new group and a new group. But this is critically important and you have to collaborate. Now I like to talk more, but I can't. So I stop with an image of a friend uh, Daan Rozegaarde, who did an art project in the Netherlands. And this is actually uh, uh, in a, one of our polders. He also did it uh, uh, in the city center of Amsterdam. And he projected the sea level, not the rise, just the level. Um, and this is the sea level of the Netherlands. So you walk underneath the water. Uh, we live below water in the Netherlands, so we talk water. When our kids are three, we throw them in the water with their clothes on, so they learn to swim. They also then learn what water really means. And that culture of water brought us also that culture of collaboration. Eh? That need to include, to have a level playing field for all. That was the base where the government said, Hank, become our water envoy. That was also the base why I was invited on uh, President Obama's Sandy Task Force. By collaboration and inclusion and by the, 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 the ambition to innovate and to tackle those future challenges, we were able to uh, actually come up with the best solutions. Rebuild by Design was such an, such an experiment. It worked. We're now in the Bay Area with Resilient by Design, and I'm hopeful that we can make it work too. Thank you. All right, anybody have any uh, questions? I, a couple questions for Hank right now before? I have one question. One question. I know he's from the Netherlands, and I've heard a lot about Hangar Mahler. Polder Mahler? Yes, very good. Can I explain it? Yes. Sure. You know what a polder is? Uh, a polder is a, a parcel of land that used to be water, where we take the water out to use it for land, sometimes for a city, sometimes for agriculture, sometimes for nature or recreation. Um, the Netherlands is a water democracy. In 1122, it's a long time ago, eh? yeah. <laughs> uh, we were no country like you were no country. Eh? This is 900 years ago. People got together in a community close to Utrecht, which is in the, in the middle of the country, and they had wet feet because of the water. The Netherlands was a very watery place. Uh, there was water everywhere. You know, if you'd done a business case on the Netherlands in 1100, you all would have moved to Germany and France. It was like, there's no economist could have made a good case. 
But we understood, they understood, building a wall around my house would actually create a conflict with the neighbor. Because then the water just goes to your neighbor. So there was not, we are not conflictuous people. We're traders. You know, we, we want to love each other so we can make money. Eh? This is like the thing. <laughs> if you hate each other, you lose. If you love, then you, this is like the added value of collaboration. So we said, why don't we get together? So the whole community got together and said, okay, if we can do this together, we need someone to do this. So they elected officials on this community scale. They paid taxes to this regional water authority. And that authority safeguarded the community. At a certain point in time, you know, this really picked up. We had 3,000 of those authorities across our country. Now that's of course fragmentation all over because it's very small. Now we have 21, they all merged over time and they're still part of our country. Those regional water authorities, that institutional capacity uh, was grounded in effect collaboration. They're the fourth layer. They were there before we were a kingdom. We, you know, it, they ensured water is part of our constitution. Uh, also, our king became a water ambassador. Eh? So, you know, based on that. And the polder model still is used um, as a reference to that because it talks to collaboration. So we have on the national level, our national government has a, um, a, 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 um, a group, a representation of all. So the workers, the scientists, the schools, the mothers, the fathers, the CEOs, the politicians, local, regional, national, and they sit in this big room and they talk. And that's what, you know, from a populistic point of view, people hate. So they say, let's get rid of the polder model. But I said, no, the polder model is our, you know, it's not only our culture, it really gives us added value because it makes us listen to each other. It buys time and in the end you can speed up because the added value that collaboration and inclusion and comprehensive approaches bring tells us why the Netherlands is the Netherlands. So that's the polder model. <laughs> oh, it stopped. <laughs> thank you. Hank only gets one question. I see that because he, thank you, Noah. <laughs> I'm going to give you a very different perspective because I'm an architect and I'm an optimist and I'm a designer. And I mean, this building is a very good example, I think, of an approach, which is that to say that let's take a really very banal old building and make it into a great public building because community matters to me. And I think one of the things that's really at the base and heart of my practice is the idea of community and social equity. And so some of the things I'm gonna talk about today really have to do with that more than uh, straightforward resiliency or protection of the shoreline. Also, I would like you to know that I'm writing a book about waterfronts. Um, there are some people here like uh, Will Travis, who has been very helpful, Hank Ovink, and a number of other people. And one of the potential titles for my project is, all my buildings are gonna be underwater. That's a pretty terrible <laughs> idea, but it's possible. But I'm gonna show you some projects that may be underwater in the future, and that's why we have Resilient by Design to think about, and Rebuild by Design to think about how to lead us out of the water. And Allison said, nobody can have a burning question today because we don't talk about this right now, but these are other issues that we have to face. Really, one of the things that I, that this is focused mostly on waterfronts, and waterfronts are at the heart of my practice. So what is the context? The context is the environment. This is the context for resiliency, the water, land, buildings, infrastructure. And these are the things that really we have to worry about for climate change. Yet today, I had to put a parenthesis around forest fires because it was forest fires, but now it's fires. It's just fires. And I think all of us in this room are just horrified by what's going on up north. It's really our community. So what are the challenges at the seam where water and land meet? What are the costs, et cetera? And how do we gain the public's confidence in the long run? This is what Hank was talking about, about a safe place. We need places where people can come together and find agreement. And for my practice, how do we influence placemaking? Because places 
for people to come together, places for community are what actually will give us the strength to face the future, in my view. The waterfront belongs to everyone, so let's find a way to make it public. Uh, what are the metrics of success? All of these are the metrics of success. And the thing that I think most about at the end of it is, is the vision. Without a vision, I don't believe that you can do something that's really, truly resilient. Security and quality, those are the Dutch principles that Hank talked about the other day when I was lucky enough to hear him speak. But they're very much at the heart of this idea. Community and culture, social equity, endurance, and long-term resiliency. So I'd like to show you a few projects that I think are exemplary in one way or another. <clears throat> Perhaps they're not completely resilient to, in terms of climate change, but they're very important projects. This is a very, very pioneering project called Gasworks Park. It was designed in the 1970s by Rich Haig, a great, great landscape architect in Seattle. And it repurposed a very, very dirty a coal gasification plant in Seattle and made it into a park for people. It kept some of the industrial language that you see there, but it also became a place where everybody comes, where you see the city on display, where it is actually resilient to climate change because it's, it has this topography that will help it. Brooklyn Bridge Park, have any of you been to Brooklyn Bridge Park in New York? I mean, other than Hank, it's a fantastic park. It repurposes Robert Moses, who you saw on Hank's slide, his piers that were built in 1953 in Brooklyn and made it into a public place for all New Yorkers, for everybody. It's a really, really interesting uh, design by Michael Van Valkenburg, who's a friend of mine. And it uses, in a didactic way, talks about sea level rise. It has this repurposed stone that uses it as an amphitheater, which becomes a theater of the city. And that's also important, that we look back and we say, this is our community. We're in it, but we're also looking at it. And that's one of the wonderful things about waterfront cities. We can look across the bay and we see this is one community that we're in. Uh, Chrissy Field, which uh, luckily enough I was able to work on as a board member of the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy, which repurposed 80 acres of asphalt, an old uh, airfield, and made it into an amazing public park right at the north edge of the San Francisco. One of the purposes of this was to tell kids who live in places that, who had no idea that San Francisco even had a bay. Can you believe that? In San Francisco, there are children who do not know that we're on a bay and that it once had a beach. That is amazing to me. So the idea was to bring water into it, to make water a feature of it, to allow habitat, a hundred different kinds of, of uh, birds came here immediately. And also the idea of bringing art into it because I believe that art is one of the things that makes community for us. It brings different audiences. It helps us see differently. And this is Mark DeSuvero's sculptures that were here for about a year, several years ago. <clears throat> Hafen City is an amazing place in Germany. It was part of Hamburg, it was bombed in the war. And they had the opportunity to build a whole new city here. It's called Hoffman City. It will have 7,000 housing units, 45,000 jobs. And they are on a river that's very, very flood prone, very dangerous, it's called the Elba. So they had a chance to build a resilient community. We don't really have a chance to build de novo like this, but I think there are a lot of lessons in this. It's a very modernist thing. It doesn't try to pretend that it was built in the Victorian era like some of the projects here do. Uh, it is very, very high-end design, but also for people. It in integrates social housing, affordable housing, schools, all kinds of things, places for people to work. And every part of it was designed to allow flooding. This is a, all the public realm like this, which you can see is at the lower level. So people can, people, can use that almost all the time, but it can flood. Uh, it integrates old and new buildings. This is old warehouses that were part of Hamburg with new construction, and it allows the water to come in. Everything is raised. It's quite challenging. We can't really do this in our own existing cities, but we can think about the lessons of this. It, each part of it was designed for special flooding, special wave conditions, and so on. This part was designed by the Banish group, 
and it's an amazing part, but look at what happened to it. But it's safe, so it allows this natural phenomenon to happen. Uh, and the, it's interesting to me that the very, the kind of poster child, the jewel in the crown of this project is a music building. It's called the Elbe Philharmonie, and it has three or four pre, uh, performance spaces. Have you been there, Hank? Well, I'm dying to go. It has immense amounts of public space. It's accessible. It combines an old and new building. The bottom was a cocoa warehouse that was built in the 50s, and this fabulous building on top. Every part of it talks about water. It's a metaphor for water. It's the waves on the top, but the skin of the building. But it's really about bringing people together in a community that shares an interest in the life of the mind, but also the life of the city. Uh, this is another amazing building. This is the Oslo Opera House and Ballet. Uh, it's a building that engages the water and invites everybody to be in the water, on the water. It's a uh, fabulously interesting place. It's at the head of the Oslo Fjord, and it is a democratic space. It's, it's in a place that's very cold a lot of the time, so you see this cold image, but inside it's as warm as anything could be. And again, is this stake in the ground for culture, for a shared community, for the idea of living together and learning. I think that's very important too. The Exploratorium, now we come to San Francisco. The Exploratorium is one of our newest projects on the waterfront. To me, it's a fabulous project because it brings life to the waterfront and it brings people to the waterfront. Um, it has, I mean, have, how many, have you all been here? It's a really, really interesting. I, you know, I take my grandchildren there. I think it's really an asset for us. This is the, uh, one of the great exhibits there. It's, it's called Strand Beast, which was a Dutch, um, what is he, designer, tinkerer, inventor. He invented these beach animals. And the, his idea was, he comes from Scheveningen. Scheveningen? I really can't pronounce, I mean, it's hard to pronounce. But it's a, it's a very important town in the Netherlands. And he read that sea level rise was coming and that was very vulnerable. So he invented these machines that walked down the beach and the idea was that they would scoop up sand and put it on the dunes to protect the shoreline. Well, it became something quite different, but I think it's quite amazing. And the Exploratorium had a great exhibit of these things. And this is actually a picture I took recently of the eclipse. And this is people coming together with a city on display, the community on display, a place of incredible experience and discovery. And finally, the ferry building, which has many things about it that are worth talking about. I think it's a wonderful project I was lucky enough to work on. But one of the things about it is that it repurposes an old building like this, actually a wonderful old building, kind of unlike the one this one started with, but you, it really was a very important building in San Francisco's history. At its high day in the, 50, in the 1920s, it was the second busiest transit hub in the world, only second to King's Cross Station in London. And it now is one of the most important buildings in San Francisco. It's important as a place to visit. It's important as a place to go shopping. It's important as a place to work. It's important as a living room for San Francisco and our community. And it supports our farming community, much of which is very vulnerable. Vulnerable not just to the fires, unfortunately, that are happening right now, but to economic stresses, to the idea of the cost of public land, of land in the Bay Area. It is a community that's very, very much under uh, a lot of stresses, and it supports these farmers. At the same time, imagine how much agricultural land it protects also. And it way, it, it's, it's a building which brings people together with nature, with what we are here, what we produce here, what our community is. And every Saturday in the summer, 100 farmers come and over 40,000 people. And to me, that's resiliency. Thank you. So I'm going to ask our three speakers to join us, uh, join me up here. And it just reminds me how important storytelling is to have such three marvelous 
uh, presenters and be able to weave a story. I, I, it was a shame I had to get up and now I have to ask you questions because I really enjoyed that so much, so thank you. Um, I also want to open it up to everybody here for questions. We have some time. I set aside some time so we can have a, a discussion. Um, but I want to start. I have some questions to start with. So thank you again so much. I am so honored to be up here with you. And it's such a delight that we're working together on this really important work here in the Bay Area. So thank, I just want to say that again. Um, so you've each provided a different perspective on resiliency. And that implies to me that resiliency is a pretty broad, it's a broad term that captures a lot of issues and approaches. So I guess the question is, is it too broad? I kind of am in the regional planning realm, but it, is it too broad? Is or, or is it helpful to have a broad framework like this where we can bring in a lot of issues and integrate them? I don't know who wants to take that one first. <laughs> You'll, um, so I mean, I think there's um, useful things about it. Um, so from from the public health perspective, I mean, I think it helps us, and we're, we're big into frameworks, so it helps us have a place to hang our hat and talk about entry points, like where, how are we related to this conceptually? Um, and at the same time, of course, um, I mean, there's all of the challenges with um, using sort of any term and, um, you know, getting into arguments with people about like what that means or should mean um, and things like that. But, but generally speaking, from my perspective, I feel that having a broad concept um, that can be inclusive of lots of dif disciplines is very useful. One thing I think is curious about resiliency is that it really is, is a, it is a very broad term, as Allison said, but to me it's a very local thing, too. That the good thing about it being broad is that we can interpret it locally, we can interpret it specifically, because that really will help us think about how design, how collaborate, I mean, how collaboration can work. And every, you know, we're not, we don't have a polder life here. We have a very contentious, complicated, angry place in America right now, I, th I think. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. I'm, I'm so happy to live here, I'm telling you. But I think we have that. And how can, so the idea of resiliency will, is a way maybe it can bring us together a little bit in a common risk and a common, hopefully, a common solution. So, I think there's, because yes, uh, I can easily agree, but that's also thanks to the broadness of the uh, of the the term. Um, but there's, for me at least, two sides to resiliency, and one is that it is a necessity; otherwise, we'll all die, which is not a good idea. So, yeah, we better be resilient. Our systems, our our our, our our interactions, our, the way we deal with the future, the personal level. But it will totally fail if it's not meaningful on a personal level. So if a politician or your neighbor, uh, your daughter or whoever can't relate to the word, then the word is gone. So we know on a theoretical and practical level, the way we work in, you know, and you probably work in the world, that resiliency is critical. Uh, uh, otherwise, we will never reach those goals in a good way. We won't learn, we won't progress, we won't bounce back better, we will not be adaptive, flexible, sustainable, and so forth, on this local, regional, national, and international scale. So that's all true. And at the same time, if nobody can relate to that word, mm. then all those needs and necessities are also gone. Mm. Uh, so I think it's also on us as professionals uh, to make a, a term that has that necessity mm -hmm. uh, meaningful on a very personal level. And that's what, you know, I also, you know, I learned it in, in the outskirts of Istanbul or now in the delta of Bangladesh or in, in uh, north of Lima in Peru, but also definitely in New Jersey and New York after Hurricane Sandy or in, in Louisiana after Katrina. That, um, and I... I, um, I, I, I take a little time for this, but it's, there was a sign. I, there, there was a man who wrote on a, 
on a wall after Hurricane Sandy. We all hate you, Sandy. And he lost a lot. You know, family, friends, house, business. So a disaster is real trouble. It's real pain. Uh, it's real hardship. Uh, and we forget, professionals tend to forget. Eh? We think a disaster is also an opportunity. And it is true, because it lays everything open. And with that openness, you really have the opportunity to leapfrog. But you can only meaningful, resiliently leapfrog if everybody is part of that jump. And that means that we have to go deep down into those communities and cry with the people and work with the people and laugh and learn uh, to let them understand, not to tell them. No, they tell us what resiliency is. Mm -hmm. And I think that type of capacity among professionals is critically lacking mm -hmm. in the world. Is Yeah, we understand resiliency in our realm, we even understand resiliency in the most integrated and comprehensive way. But we have a hard time to make those connections with the people that have to tell us what resiliency means for them. That's a good segue. Thank you. Um, okay. <laughs> it's a good segue. Um, did you have something else you wanted? No, okay. Um, okay, that's good. Thank you. Um, I, you know, this is kind of a long sentence, but I think it's related to what you just said, Hank. Uh, unlike traffic congestion or soaring housing cost, resilience is often harder to communicate to the public focused on day-to-day -day challenges of living in our expensive region or any region. Issues like sea level rise require sustained and meaningful action and investments over decades. And investments to improve resilience don't always have the immediate payoff that you might find with, say, a new transit line um, or uh, that might transform someone's commute overnight. How can we better, and this gets to, you know, how do we better engage um, our Bay Area residents on this issue um, while recognizing that the payoff may be especially meaningful for future generations? What's the it's a, it's a challenge? I'm going to thank Dave Vaughton for that question. That was, a <laughs> that was an MTC question right there. <laughs> Maybe we should ask the audience. Yeah, anyone have a response to that? OK. Yeah, I was just writing uh, in response to the meaningful on a personal level for each individual, we have to re-include people who have been pushed down. And so we have to whether we f you know go up yours to him or not we have to tell people we are in it together and we're here for you you're here for us and we're here for you first because you know that you haven't yet you've been dispossessed so we acknowledge the dispossession inherent in our economy and our social and political system we can then say ah we can actually, let's try the new Apollo program. Let's put an overhead bi-directional monorail from across the deep wet places from, from one center to the other. Let's do things, let's, when, you know, let's elevate the houses by sticking captive columns under them and using them to, to lift them up and build the foundation up to them. Let's do a lot of things that we can do to make a sustainable, resilient place and, and in mixed in, in with mixed in with those structural things, let's do the the common markets. Let's do the um, the community centers. Let's actually go to the people who already built community centers, you know, out somewhere, and say, let's empower you to do more of what you do. One thing I I really have admired about the Netherlands is just a little aside is that I feel as though um, and you may. And maybe some secret gene thing you have, but they're willing to try a lot of stuff and willing to fail. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that what we're so risk averse that here, then so contentious that people are always saying, well, no, we don't want to try anything new. And one of the th things I admire deeply about design in the Netherlands, for example, in the city of Amsterdam is building a whole new part of the city on islands that they've made up. And as they go along, 
each one of them learns from the last one. I mean, it's it's not as though you have to do the perfect everything mm -hmm. right from the beginning, but I, I, I think that informality and willing to just try something, mm -hmm. we, are, we need to start doing that because we're not gonna do anything otherwise. Okay, here, okay. I think the answer to your question is how do we make that connection? That's the real most important um, question. And what I see is that you have to create a connection to the environment. People have to see their environment. The slide that you presented, I think it was the Brooklyn base, where they were sitting there at the amphitheater looking at a city. And then you mentioned how here in the Bay Area, there are lots of kids who can't even have that imagery or even that vision. So that picture in itself was very powerful because not only were they seeing their environment, but they were seeing their connection. So you have to be able to create the imagery and let people see who they are in that environment. I mean, I'm looking at the slides and I see you showing the eclipse and I'm also looking at the makeup of the people who are there. And how can it be more inclusive? Well, maybe the bridge is just allowing people to see themselves in the environment, in their connection, and their story. Not in a bad, it could be in a bad way, but in the way that has made them who they are and how strong they are in that environment instead of having to resist it so much. But celebrating self, environment, imagery, and envisioning their connection to it. I'm so glad you brought that up because I feel like in the Bay Area we have been completely cut off from our water. You know, you have the room for the river, but we have no, even though we live in the Bay, we have been completely cut off from our waterfront. And so some of those, I'm looking at some of those images up there, I'm like, I want that. Like, how do we get that? So thank you. That was a really good point. Did anyone have a comment to her comment? Yeah. Just to add also to your question, um, uh, there's actually a, a, a bad story on Amsterdam for the connection, but I'm, uh, I will tell you uh, in a different situation. But they built a station in between the water and the city, so that was like the worst. So they put their back against the water. Now they have to open it again. But to your, to your both to the question and your point, um, uh, working in the New York region after Hurricane Sandy, uh, my team. Uh, got as much hate mail as invites because eh? uh, there's a lot of distrust and especially when you work for the federal government there's more distrust it's like an increasing e even under a president obama it doesn't really matter it's like you're for the federal government go away so they really got we don't want to see you we don't want to see design teams we don't trust you we uh, you know uh, also because there was real despair and real need but also you know this is great so for us it was really a kind of stubbornness uh, and it's also like a, a cultural thing uh, if that resiliency is this professional understanding that there is a necessity then we would ne we should never give up reaching out eh? if somebody says go away that should almost be an invite to go come again and again and change the way you talk so we came with teams and then they said go away so we said oh let's go alone and in New York, there is a because uh, I, I I liked your example on the on the kids is there is a school. It's called the Harbor School because in New York, a lot of kids don't know what water is because they're you know far 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 away from waterfront. Uh, but the Harbor School brings the kids from all these communities in all the boroughs, uh, brings them to their school on Governors Island, and they learn how to swim. And they learn what water is and how to drink it and see the fish and the smallest species of microscopes. And they also talk about climate change and sea level rise and other stuff. And these kids are from all over, so they bring then their parents. So uh, um, uh, working on Staten Island and on the Lower East Side, and that is also to your point of bringing people back to the water, 
Uh, the Maris Rays le leads the good old Lower East Side, the community groups on the Lower East Side that organize themselves after Hurricane Sandy say, okay, and the Lower East Side does not want beautification. They're afraid. They don't want a, they don't want a subway station because they're afraid of gentrification. Every, every thing that's becoming better in their neighborhoods, they fear because any improvement might lead to real estate prices going up and before you know it, they're gone, right? right? So they protect their ugliness of the neighborhoods as an asset. So when we said we're gonna, and it flooded, you know, it all flooded uh, and, you know, terrible. So we, we said, this is one of our first projects we're gonna take on. And they said, no, you know, don't. You're, you're gonna give us access to the water and a park that actually is protecting us, <laughs> you know, fear. And she did do it. So she challenged her community. She challenged herself. She couldn't sleep. And we went back and back and built this relationship. And now we're implementing one of the biggest projects coming out of Rebuild by Design. It's this amazing berm that's also a park that has bridges across the FDR. So they can cross, they can access the water. Uh, uh, it's funded. Uh, they will, you know, they're in the last phase of the engineering. Um, and the community is, you know, still embracing this. And the, the beauty is that they are still our biggest partner. But at the jury presentation, the mayor of race and the whole coalition stand in front of Secretary Donovan and me and the other jurors. And she said, from, from our heart, and I think that's, you know, Rebuilt by Design made us sit on the same side of the table. And I got so, I got, you know, it, it, it hits you. And then Donovan, who was a commissioner on the Bloomberg, a housing commissioner, whispered in my ear and said, uh, well, that was different when I was a commissioner, <laughs> which was true. And she overheard him and she walked up to him and she slammed her hand on the table and said, but we can easily sit on the other side again. And that's the thing. Building this relationship, building that trust, it stays vulnerable. And we should not forget, we're all different. Eh? Uh, a, a politician can build that trust, but he, you know, especially, they go home uh, to a safe place. But the community, with that trust, still goes home to a non-safe place. So it's not easy, and it is hard work, and it never stops. Thank you, Hank. I did want to just make a note to Kathy. I wish she would have designed some quieter floors out there. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> These roll, I just wish we would have had, like, as we were rolling stuff, that they might have been. I'm just kidding. I, I just think about being older, you can't hear anything. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to quickly mention um, that, that in public health, we this is a big challenge for us because we're always trying to prevent things that are not currently happening. And two of the, um, the three things I would say that we've learned, one is how do you actually not stigmatize the thing that you're trying to prevent, right? So we're always talking about how bad things can be. And um, we know that fear doesn't really work. Um, even though um, all this stuff is scary and there is a lot of risk, but risk doesn't um, just risk and just talking about how scary everything is doesn't seem to motivate people, which is not that hard to understand. Um, but there is sort of a nuance in there in terms of perceived risk. So there's this um, sort of notion that you have to think of yourself at risk if you're going to take an action. But, but the further thing is you have to think of yourself as um, you're only going to think about your per ability to... Um, sorry, your risk if you ha feel an ability to respond to that risk. So people shut down when they feel like they don't know what they're supposed to do. So when we just sort of keep talking about risk um, without talking about what people can do, uh, that is not that effective either. And then as, as you were saying, I, mean, I think we've really learned that when people feel a sense of connection and something positive, um, humans want to flourish, humans want to grow, they want to survive. So um, I, I think as far as we can be compelling through our design and our processes, I think that's um, really important. Well, I, I totally agree. And I think, I think the thing is that um, the positive side of it really has to be there because it is terrifying, really scary to think about this. We have a challenge here in the Bay Area because we haven't had a hurricane, 
sea level rise is very subtle, it's very slow, it's fast in a global way, but it's really slow. And how do we find a way to communicate this? I mean, I think that that is one of our biggest challenges. And I totally agree that it has, we have to find a way to make it a positive thing. If we just say, oh, it's so scary and there's these terrible stresses and so on, we're experiencing that right now in Sonoma, Napa, Mendocino County, Solano County. And I personally find it terrifying, really. I mean, ashes in my Noe Valley garden, smoke you can't, you can smell. But we have to find a way to make this our resilient by design challenge, not only a clear communication of risk, but a clear communication of the positive benefits of thinking about it right now. Thank you. Okay, help me out, everybody. Who is next? You are next. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to ask you one question with two parts. The first is, when I was in planning classes in 73, we had speakers come in and talk to us, future thinkers, and they told us, forget about the bottom 25% in your planning. They make no difference. If you plan for them, you're wasting your time because they economically make no difference. I'm sensing a sea change in planning, uh, and I, I like that. Uh, and I would, I, <laughs> and I, I meant it. And, and I, I, I want you to comment on that and how that's caused a lack of resilience uh, in the Bay Area with that attitude. And the second part is, and I think it goes along with this, I'm very concerned, not only locally, but worldwide, about the corporate takeover of water supply. Comment on that. Okay. Anybody? Either of those? Anybody want to take that on? No. Well, the, the first is easy. Yeah. <laughs> The first is easy and scary, but we have had scarier moments in time when it comes to planning. Uh, and so, uh, uh, but I, I, I do hope, although I don't see it everywhere, but I'm, you know, very optimistic. There's a far more inclusive approach uh, to planning and design. Uh, it's also uh, amazing uh, when I talk to my students across the world, not only in Harvard. They make these connections easily, you know, uh, health school and, and business school and design school, you know, do projects together. It's all, it's all over. So forget about planning, I would say, uh, especially when you forget about the 25%. Yeah, yeah it's a no-go. Um, thank you. But on the, uh, but on the, on the water side, that's a tougher uh, question because I, you know, um, I'm Sherpa to the high-level panel on water. Uh, so it's a global uh, 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 effort. And we don't value water. Yeah, uh, uh, it, it actually says water is a human right. So that actually prevents uh, a lot of places around this world to price water. Now, pricing water and valuing water are different things. And I, I chair the panel in Stockholm at the International Water Week on valuing water. And the finance minister of Ecuador was on my panel. Uh, and he said, you know, I don't know a lot about water, he said, but uh, as a finance minister, um, but uh, I know my constitution. And I'm not allowed to price water. Uh, so, but, you know, water is scarce in the whole world uh, and definitely also in Ecuador. How can I value it? Uh, uh, so finding a way, a mechanism to have a, a, a leverage between... <coughs> Uh, water and demand, uh, public and private, uh, uh, individual and corporate, is critically important. Uh, but I think that the, the uh, water as a human right also has an opportunity. Uh, uh, and corporatization of water across the world uh, is increasing uh, 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 inequality. Uh, but it's not only that. Uh, Africa, 70-75% uh, of people in Africa live in informal settlements. There is no infrastructure in informal settlements, otherwise they would not be informal. Uh, that means they get water through trucks. The trucks have no health control. So 5,000 people die every day in Africa just because of health issues directly related to that water. 
and they pay five to 50 times as much as when you know the people in Africa that open the tap. That's not corporatism. Uh, that's terrible. But that, so the problem with water around the world is uh, a little bigger. Uh, Do we have a question here? Hi, thank you. Um, I'm Deborah McCoy from the Center for Cities and Schools at Berkeley. And I want to touch on a couple of, or ask you a question that touches on some of what you talked about, starting with the Harbor School in, in New York that I'm really familiar with. And that's the role of young people in resilience. Um, and I really appreciate working with RBD on the role of young people. Um, but one project that we've done for the past six years really brings this to light in my question, which is we've worked with over 800 young people from Tohoku, Japan who were survivors of the great earthquake and tsunami and talk about young people that understand the power of water. Because um, in order to come to this initiative, you had to have somehow felt been directly impacted and want to be a part of the change. And the kids have changed a lot, as you might imagine. They're all high school students over the last six years. But the two things that are consistent is one, the need for connection, absolutely. Every year they come and they talk about, we survived because we were connected as a community. And they'll tell Bay Area kids, stay connected, get connected. But the second is this depth of invisibility that is getting worse, not better. And it's a really painful fact about marginalized populations, whether they're young or old or poor. Um, you know, it's hard to keep up and to have adults help you be visible, right? When they're so relegated to being invisible and almost used to being invisible. So question is, as individuals with such deep expertise in this work, how do we help young people be visible consistently, not just when the crisis happens, but consistently in that work, kind of tactically, right? Like tactful, not theoretically, it's awesome theory, but in your practice, how do we do that? This is the, the, the toughest and easiest question, because uh, if I have to answer it, uh, the, the words are simple, just do it, uh, because it's easy. Uh, I lead, I'm on a high-level panel on water, and the first thing I said, we have to include the young and the youth. I have, uh, when I was appointed a special envoy for international water affairs, I immediately reached out to uh, kids in schools, very young, uh, we started a competition, uh, a battle of the beach. Uh, we have uh, programs on schools, on water around the world. I have a group of youngsters that are uh, from between 18 and 25 that are in university or just graduated that help me do works on water awareness. We do this in Bangladesh, in Vietnam. So it, it's not hard. Uh, I really think it's not hard, but we don't. So the question is, how do we change? And this is the bigger question, but that taps into something totally different. It's got nothing to do with kids or poor or, or vulnerable or women or whatsoever. Is that uh, uh, there? We want the easy way out, uh, all of us. Uh, and and you all have friends that really think we can fix climate change, for instance. Eh? Bring us a salute. You can't fix climate change. It's there. Uh, get used to it. It's going to stay for another thousand years. So this is not for a generation. Uh, this is forever. Uh, so really rethink how we work together, live together, uh, approach each other, include each other. That's tough. Look at the world. I, I mean, I can't answer your question on that highest level. Kathy, do you have a way to answer the question? Just, I, I, I don't have an answer to your question, which I love and I really care about. But I'd like to give an analogy, which is um, <clears throat> a Bay Area analogy. Alice Waters lives in Berkeley, and she lives near a school called the Martin Luther King School, which had an asphalt playground that was gigantic. I mean, acres of asphalt everywhere. And every day she walked by it in her morning exercise, and would go to the principal's office, who was a wonderful man named Neil Smith, and complain, and complain. And finally, she got under his skin. And he said, well, OK, so what am I supposed to do about it? She said, well, let's plant a garden. And this is at Martin Luther King Middle School in Berkeley. It's a school, a very diverse school. And they planted a garden, and that started something called the Edible Schoolyard, we probably all know about. And that movement has spread around the whole country, and you know maybe around the world, Alice is capable of that. She got Michelle Obama, after trying 
as hard as she could to get the Clintons to do it. She did not succeed in that way, but she got Michelle Obama to build a garden in the White House, which they still have, which ridiculously. <laughs> but they, I, I mean, think really, works the idea of organic actually. food and that, anyway. Um, anyway, so kids started coming home from many communities and saying, guess what? Today I had a fava bean and it was delicious. And the parents said, well, what's a fava bean? So, I mean, it's one step at a time is my point. It takes a person and then it takes a village and then it takes a community and then it takes a city and then it takes a, a state, a country. And, and, but that's how we have to do it. We have to do it one step at a time, but let's do it. That's right, it takes all of us. Okay, we have time for one more question. You've, we have one hand back up here, so sorry. Hi, my name is Cesar Moran, I'm from Peru. Um, I invited to this Brazilian by Design contest. So I wanted to add something, uh, you said, Henry. Um, we were challenged two years ago to create a resilient value chain for Costco. And that meant, which is the major challenge. challenge, Costco wants to double its size, but it wants to become resilient. So we, they pinpointed a small Brazil nut community in Peru and in Bolivia, and we had to design how could that be resilient in terms of climate change. And of course, these are conservation, you know, Brazilian concessions that are handed by the government in Peru. And in the Bolivian side, these are native communities. So we had to transform a value chain that's vertical to horizontal, which meant in a certain way creating the platform by which people will present their fears, become transparent with that, and eventually create trust all along the value chain so it became one entity. We started with zero containers and ended up with 30 after two years, a uh, two year process. So I see what you're saying. To become resilient means to, at some way or the other, present a platform by which people can present their fears, expose their vulnerabilities, and in that sense, create the space to, for something new to become, to appear. In this case, it was this res re resilient value chain. So I talked, we work, we're still talk in communication with Costco, and this value chain is growing more farmers, more transformers, more, and in the, and what was really successful was to see sitting at the same table, native community farmers, native Bolivians, and Sherry Flies, the general manager for Costco for its, its, its sustainable development plan, at the same table discussing what are the promises, what could be the right price for a sustainable value chain in the future. So that meant, Everybody at the same process understand that this value chain was an entity, a living entity, and not just a, a vertical process by which the top decides what the bottom has to do. So I think that's a lesson learned. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was great. That was great. <laughs> I think that was a good way to end. What about, what about you? Uh, thank you so much. Thanks. I just want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, this is important. It's important for us to keep having conversations like this. And thank, thank, let's thank our speakers tonight. And stay tuned. We'll have other Metro Talks. Uh, and uh, let's keep working together. Oh, thank you.